Now it's because we are spiritual agents as well as moral agents that we are capable not just of using neutral objects for good or evil purposes, but also of imbuing those neutral objects with spiritual significance. Let me explain what I mean by referring back to our trusty rock. Viewers of the Fuel Project series Know Your Enemy will remember that in ancient times people would take rock and build obelisks as monuments to the demonic gods Baal and Asherah. As we know, rock is morally neutral and not inherently evil. But because these obelisks were designed as an act of worship to Satan, they became a profane thing in the sight of God and he despised them. In a similar way, we know that God's people in the Old Testament used morally neutral rock to build temples and altars, which were then consecrated to God to make them holy. So you see, one man could take a type of rock and make an obelisk to Baal with it, and another man could take the exact same type of rock and build a temple to God with it. In doing so, one has been imbued with profanity and the other with holiness. Because we are spiritual beings, we are capable of imbuing neutral things with spiritual significance. To use another example, in Know Your Enemy, we looked at how occultists create symbols and imbue them with hidden meanings and power. Again, shapes and lines are neutral things. There's nothing inherently evil about a triangle, circle or a square. But when they are created with a diabolical intention, demons attach themselves to it to fulfill the symbol's purpose, and it is then imbued with evil. I call this the Jonathan Livingston Siegel effect in Know Your Enemy, and this is essentially what witchcraft is about. So for example, someone could create a god out of thin air, just out of their imagination, and call it Barris, the bear god. They could build a wooden idol for it in the shape of a bear, and a demon will then assign itself to the position of Barris to receive worship. In a sense, Barris, although initially created from thin air and imagination, becomes spiritually real, but only in the sense that a demon has taken on the role. Indeed, behind every idol and every false god, there's a demon. Therefore God will despise that idol and everything associated with it because of what it has been imbued with and what it represents. What I'm trying to say in a convoluted way is that because we are spirit, we can affect the spiritual realm and the spiritual realm can affect us. And what happens in the spirit eventually works itself out into the physical. We can look at neutral things, therefore, as a blank canvas or empty containers. We can fill them with spiritual significance, and this has repercussions that people often don't think about. For example, if you have things in your home like Buddhas, African tribal masks, dream catchers, Masonic aprons, obelisks, occult books, Ouija boards, rock music that glorifies Satan, or anything of that nature, although these things are made from basically neutral stuff like wood, fabric, or plastic, they have in fact been consecrated to demonic spirits. They have been imbued with diabolical spiritual significance. And because that's the case, not only are they a detestable thing in the sight of God, but those same demonic spirits are now most likely being given legal access to your home. Turn to Deuteronomy in the Bible and we'll see how God tells his people that they must be vigilant in keeping their camp clean of detestable objects. You must burn their idols in fire, and you must not covet the silver or gold that covers them. You must not take it, or it will become a trap to you, for it is detestable to the Lord your God. Do not bring any detestable objects into your home, for then you will be destroyed, just like them. You must utterly detest such things, for they are set apart for destruction. In ancient times, it was common for idols to be made of wood and then covered with a layer of beaten gold or silver. God says in the strongest language possible that even the silver and gold that covers the idols must be destroyed because although silver and gold is essentially neutral stuff, the fact it has been consecrated or set apart for the worship of demonic gods has made it a thing set apart for destruction. You see, because Satan is set apart for destruction, everything consecrated to him is set apart for destruction along with him. And if we can go off on a slight tangent here, that's why there's hell. Hell was meant for Satan and his demons, not for humans. But if you follow him, if you consecrate yourself to him, you'll go where he goes and meet the same end that he meets. Jesus talks about the day of judgment when God will turn people away saying, Away with you, you cursed ones, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his demons. People often ask why God would prepare this place called hell for humans. He didn't. He prepared it for Satan and his demons. But 
If humans follow him, they'll end up where he ends up, as will everything else that was set apart for him. We'll look at what it means to follow Satan later. It's much more mundane than one might imagine. Getting back on point though, anything consecrated to Satan is a despised thing to be destroyed and we can get more insight into how such things can affect us by turning to the book of Joshua in the Bible. Setting the scene for the event, the Israelites have just entered the promised land and are busy cleaning up the occultism and fighting against the pagan tribes who live there. If you read the book of Joshua, you'll notice that right up until the seventh chapter, their campaign had been a breeze. In fact, they just witnessed the walls of the mighty city of Jericho supernaturally fall to the ground in front of their eyes by essentially going for a stroll around it. God was with them and everything was easy. But then, suddenly things change. They try to attack a small and insignificant town called Ai, and because of previous success, they are so confident that they don't even bother to send in their whole army. They've just taken down Jericho. Ai will be a breeze. So they pick a few thousand people to do the job, while the rest wait outside for news of the inevitable victory. Except they don't get the victory. Those waiting outside are absolutely stunned when they look and see their own army turning on their heels and being chased out of Ai, defeated in a battle they should have easily won. Paralyzed with fear at this turn of events, they ask God what has happened and why things suddenly got so difficult. Why has he taken his hand of blessing off them? What was the point of him giving them the heavily fortified city of Jericho in such an easy way if he was just going to let them be slaughtered by a bunch of villagers with pitchforks in the next battle? God tells them that the reason for their frustration was that a man from their own camp called Achan had plundered a detestable object from one of the previous pagan towns and had stashed it amongst his own belongings, a Babylonian robe along with 200 coins and some gold. Because of the presence of that detestable object in the camp, God's blessing was temporarily removed from them and that led to their defeat. Why was it detestable to God? We don't know for sure. Perhaps the robe had been consecrated to Baal and used in pagan religious ceremonies. The Bible doesn't say. But as soon as they removed that detestable object from their camp, God was with them once more. They went back into Ai and won the battle easily. So when God was with them, everything was easy, and when they were disobedient by defiling their camp with a profane object, God removed his presence and things that should have been easy were difficult. There's a principle there for all Christians to take heed of. It would benefit us all if we went through our homes systematically and discerningly throwing away any objects which are detestable to the Lord. It is possible that you are being frustrated in life because you harbour objects which are a profane thing in his sight. In Acts 19, when Paul preached the gospel to the people of Ephesus, many became believers and repented of their sinful practices. The first thing they did was to take all their items of sorcery and books of incantation and burn them in a public bonfire. The value of the objects in the bonfire was estimated to be the equivalent of millions of dollars in today's money, and no doubt they could have been sold. However, the value didn't matter. They needed to be destroyed. We should do likewise with anything in our homes that dishonours God. Don't sell them and pass the problem on to someone else. Just burn them or destroy them in some other way. I have personal experience of this principle. When I was a teenager, I was asked to move in with a non-Christian girl and I was pretty set on the idea. My parents felt that my moral judgement was being clouded by some of the objects in my room, namely some of the rock CDs in my collection. While I was out one evening, my parents, completely independently of one another, both felt God suddenly telling them that they should pray and anoint my bedroom with oil. They both planned to do it separately, so were surprised when they bumped into one another in the hall, both with a bottle of oil in their hands and heading for my room. They didn't tell me they'd done it, but the very next day I had a sudden change of heart and I said no to the girl. Not long after that, I also began to be convicted of the music I'd been listening to and began throwing out a lot of my CDs. It was only much later that my parents told me the story of what had happened, but my thinking and behaviour had changed almost instantly. A spiritual battle had been won. I eventually threw out my entire catalogue of secular rock CDs and could instantly feel an almost tangible lightness in the atmosphere. I only realised that there had been a heaviness after it had gone. My cousin also tells of a series of problems that he experienced in his home when he unwittingly brought back two Buddha bookends from Thailand. 
Things started going missing. There were nightmares, blackouts, things breaking, and even a 666 appearing on the wall of their living room, which couldn't be scrubbed off by any means, and which only disappeared when they invited a group from church to come and pray. The principle? Keep your camp clean. And keep remembering, this phenomenon works in both directions, for good and for bad. During Paul's same trip to Ephesus that ended with the public bonfire of occult items, it was reported that when handkerchiefs or aprons that had been in Paul's possession touched the sick, they were healed and demonic spirits were expelled. Although a slightly different situation, there's also the story in the Gospels of a woman just touching Jesus' robe in faith and her illness being instantly healed. So not only should we watch what we allow into our homes and remove detestable objects from our camps to keep them clean, but it would also be a worthwhile exercise to proactively consecrate ourselves, our homes and our possessions to God. As for the occult items in your home, it's possible you are more frustrated and affected by the influence of those objects than you know, just like the Israelites under Joshua's command. I'll include a checklist of some common occult items as an appendix to the series, but don't rely solely on it. Let the Holy Spirit guide you and always respond to your conscience. God speaks through it. So in these first two parts we have established some basic things which can be encapsulated by our symbol. Namely that neutral things can be used for good or evil by moral agents like ourselves, and that they can even be imbued with holiness or profanity by spiritual beings like ourselves. Also, what is happening in our souls and spirits is going to have an effect on our external decisions. Finally, it's also worth noting that we are capable of completely neutral acts too. If I took the dishes out of the dishwasher and put them in a cupboard, I haven't done anything moral or immoral there. It remains a completely neutral act. That seems like a pointless statement now, but it will become important later on.